You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SER. We are Flex and Herds. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour, and it is the final week of the Benson murder case. Flex, I can't believe it. You couldn't even figure out who the killer was. You ruined everything. Flex, this is such an easy mystery. It was. It was a very easy mystery, and I'm <laughs> I'm proud to be taking my point for this story once oh, again. come on. I, I got my entire family to read this story oh, along, really? along with us, and every single one of them picked the major by chapter eight. So either my family is all geniuses along with me, or this story is ridiculously maybe, easy. Maybe it's a genetics thing. Either maybe way, it's I just get to your take family. For it. That's fine. Your family can have <laughs> the points. You can have the points. Sean can have the points. I'll just sit over here buying my time for the perfect murder case. Uh, it's it's going to be the story that I offer you like a thousand points for that you solve. And Obviously, then nothing before or after it. That's how most game shows work, and that's basically what this is. But yes, we are discussing <laughs> The Benson Murder Case by S.S. Van Dyne. It's a wonderful novel set in the early 20th century in New York. Mm. With our detective Philo Vance, we are covering chapters 19 to the end of the story, mm-hmm. where the culprit has been revealed. It is Major Benson, the brother yeah. of the deceased. Not too many surprises there. He's one of the first characters introduced in the story, which fits with my usual modus operandi. Uh, it turns out that the major was in every scene that he shows up in, pointing fingers at other characters, trying to sway the detective, but he figured out five minutes in, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, and that's definitely an interesting point to make, is that mm. Philo Vance comes into this case and supposedly immediately solves it, but yep. then takes 20-plus chapters to actually bother to tell anyone. Have we mentioned that Philo Vance is the worst? <laughs> Utterly insufferable. Um <laughs> I thought the strangest thing about this entire novel was that the most human that Philo Vance seemed throughout the entire thing was in the ballistic scene. Yep. uh, Where he's describing, you know, how we got from this point to this point and how tall they are. And he's bringing his friends along from the right. And he's like, and you, Markham, how tall do you think the guy is? And you hold the piece of string. Mm. And it's a great scene of them all buddy copying each other. But then he's just awful to everyone from then on. Yeah, it was really funny. Uh, we kind of talked about this last week, but watching him go from character to character and to every other character, he apparently is just lovely. It's just <laughs> Markham. It's so who, strange. He just, he he loves him apparently, according to the narration, but they just constantly fighting and every character who he interviews, he says, that Markham, boy, he's suspecting you. He thinks you're a real dirtbag, but I think you're a good person. <laughs> he good cops the whole thing despite being the baddest cop in there. This was way too much for Markham. The wearing down process of Vance's imitations and veiled innuendos had at last dissipated his self-control. He bent forward and struck the desk angrily with his hand. So? I was keeping her precious captain locked up and you were pleading with me to let him go. You know damned well I didn't think either one of them was guilty, you you lounge lizard. He has so much room to be a brilliantly self-aware character, but he just doesn't read that way. And there are so many of those moments where he's, you know, playing off these people and intelligently weaving around their psyche to get them to think this thing or the other. But it it just, it never feels like that's the way. It just feels like S.S. Van Dyne as a socially inept person was writing what he thought a socially competent person was like. Yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't work. He's (laughs) he's very much trying to like make up for his own flaws and project and all that fun stuff that writers should never do. But apparently it was very successful. I know that audiences, like, this was a very uh, fiscally successful novel, um, but it's not really that well known now, which is a bit sad. Yeah, and I mean, we've spoken about a lot of the reasons that I think that is, in that his detective was insufferable, he was set in a very particular period of time where these references would have been relevant, so it doesn't age particularly well in that, even if you exclude the characterization. Yeah. Um, it's also that he came up in a film industry that was still very much being discovered. Mm-hmm. So even though he might have been the highest selling film of all time, he was the highest selling film, you know, fr- film franchise of the time in amongst dozens of other franchises that mm-hmm. have also been forgotten. Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a bit of a shame, but that's okay because we are here to remember him. <laughs> we will remember. And, uh, and judge him for character flaws we aren't yes. even certain he had. Can, can I... <laughs> While we're talking about character flaws, Mm. we have to talk about Vance's triumphant moment. Yes. Arguably the best moment in this entire novel. Hands down the best moment. Let's let's make this clear. The lead up is, you know, they're about to arrest Major Benson. And and the narration says, you know, we see Vance, like, pull away from the table slightly. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh, okay, that means he's not going to be there. Because he's going to be right. Like, yeah, obviously he's, he's, he's just going right. to lean back, you relax, know, enjoy yeah. himself. While, while Benson and the cops, like, they fight it out. Because they can probably take him down. There's, like, four of them and one of him. Even if he's tough, they'll, they'll get through it. But Vance not only escapes harm, 
but also completely takes him apart. Like he moves in, like grabs him by the arm and and dismantles the Major Benson. So not only is he incredibly smart and talented and good looking and, and wealthy and a psychologist and a good actor and he has lovely friends that are well connected, he's also like a ninja. Yeah, <laughs> like expert yeah. martial artist. If, yeah. you, if you've seen the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock yes. remakes where we have those cutaways where he's like, and now I will do this and this and just and pull his t- apart. tears apart the fights. Yeah. I I would I would wager that that came from this franchise. Yes, that I that would. was inspired by the way that scene reads mm-hmm. because that is like one to one right there. I, and if it was anyone other than Philo Vance, would have loved it. <laughs> I was going to say, look, I know I talk about the Robert Downey Jr. movie a lot on this show, but if that had been a, a Philo Vance movie, I'm just saying, would have made so much sense. It would have. It would have. And maybe it was originally intended to be. Maybe it was. We'll never know. You know what else we'll never know, Herds? Tell me, Flex. What Leander Fife had to do with anything. Who's Leander Fife? I've forgotten by this point. Was he, he was a character? The, he was the owner of was the he? Cadillac. Oh, yeah, there was a Cadillac. What was the Cadillac doing there? Uh, absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. This is why when we were going over theories and you were like, oh, that Fife guy, I'll bet we'll get to see more about him and throw more suspicion on him. No. Nah. Not at all. He's just dropped. Like many aspects of this however, book, he just dropped. However, I was right in that Vance was uh, suspecting him as the only second possible culprit. Yes, yes, this is true. So I'd got I'd gotten that far, even yeah. if even if he didn't actually show up again. Uh, I I do appreciate the level of detail or the time in the spotlight, I should say, um, that that Lecoq gets in particular. Yes. Um, that scene was the silliest. It was very absurd. It was a scene which it's the cross examination. This is supposed to be a huge moment for the the mystery where we finally sit down with the criminal and we figure out what's going on in their head. But it's totally thrown to the side. It's almost played for laughs in the way that Vance says, you know, yeah. you're a fool. You're a fool, Lecoq. Why would you even bother doing this? You're a terrible liar. You're an idiot. I really enjoyed the scene, but it feels entirely unwarranted. Well, what, one of the things that particularly interested me is, as I say, it's definitely a staple of the genre, the cross-examination. Mm. Usually that's the most tense part of the novel, where we finally get to see the wits of the criminal played against the detective. But that scene in particular felt like it had no tension at all, mostly because I think most readers can even tell that Lecoq is just making things up on the spot. Um, he, he continuously is is forgetting things and trying to make stuff up, and we can tell and Vance can tell. And that's kind of a... Uh, a line running through the whole novel is that the tension isn't really there. This isn't really a race against time. There's no sense that there'll be another murder. We are simply given this puzzle and we kind of meander about between the characters, asking them to come to us. There's no real feeling that anything is going on in the city other than this case itself. Yeah. And I mean, I do like the way that Vance has played off the cross-examination. It feels like the most self-aware part of the book in that he has gone like, oh, don't you hate it when those cross-examinations really mean nothing and you Mm -hmm. can obviously tell that everyone's making it up and he's he's making fun of that in this scene. For sure. Um, Which, as I say, is probably the most self-aware moment in the book. But uh, it maybe, you know, it it still doesn't feel super justified. Mm. Though admittedly, we do get one of the best lines in the book after it. You see how silly the confession is? What? Our pure and lofty captain is an incredibly poor Munchausen. No one could lie as badly as he did who hadn't been brought into the world that way. He just calls the captain an idiot and we move on. You know, murder mysteries are often expounded for their their final twists. Even as you say, if so many people can guess the killer only eight chapters in, it's doing its job. Yeah. Um, It's like a well-oiled machine. Yeah, and I mean, this was his first novel, right? It was, yeah. we're judging him very harshly for <laughs> what most people would consider to be a draft. Yeah. Like some people will come in and they will define a genre with their first story, mm. but you know, Van Dyne is not one of those people and that's okay. I don't think that the franchise will get better as you get further through it because of the reputation that we know it has from looking into it. Mm. But at the same time, it also seems like the kind of franchise that, you know, book 12 is going to be exactly as good as book one. It's and a- I enjoyed this book. It's a comfort book, right? It's, I have read one Philo Vance novel, the rest of them are probably not going to be anything different. Yeah, and even if you're not into dealing with Philo Vance, the insufferable written detective, Mm. there is a full series of movies out there uh, we might be getting to if you stick around and listen on. Oh my goodness, are you saying we're going to travel to the world of black and white picture? I think we might have to. Ooh, that's going to be fun. That's coming up a bit later on the show. We'll talk a bit more about that. Right now, it's time to chat with Dr. Chris Cody from the University of Sydney, Senior Lecturer in Musicology about jazz. Stick around. Mm. 
You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SCR. This is Flex and Herds. We're here to slow things down and give you a break from thinking about all those brain-scratching puzzles, murder and death. So we're chatting with Christopher Cody from the uh, University of Sydney, a senior lecturer in musicology. He's here to talk about smooth, smooth jazz. Chris, welcome to the show. No, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's lovely to have you here. So, why was the early 20th century the perfect time for jazz to cultivate? That, that's a really interesting question. I think that there are probably a lot of things that are happening in the earliest 20th century, particularly in New Orleans, that make you know um, that a site that, that where jazz is, is sort of likely to emerge from. It's, you know, New Orleans is really different from Mm. other parts of the United States. People of different races and different backgrounds um, are interacting, particularly in the early 20th century. And so you have this jazz, which kind of comes from uh, a range of different cultural traditions, some of them um, African traditions that have been transported to the United States, some of them sort of Western art song traditions that were alive and well in New Orleans, but sort of being performed regularly by people of color in that city. And so there's a, you know, a lot of um, opportunity in New Orleans during the early 20th century for these musical ideas to kind of come together um, in new and exciting ways. So that's, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons we, we sort of get it in, in New Orleans. I mean, one of the reasons that I think it resonates in the, early 20th century is that you have this this push toward being a, a modern society. You know, people are thinking about what being modern means to them in all sorts of different ways. And you have this music that is this um, sort of hodgepodge of influences, this, this culmination of all these different influences in a way that people had not heard before. And so there's this real attempt by people from a range of different backgrounds to sort of, you know, celebrate jazz as as being a, a sign that, um, you know, the United States is becoming a, a modern place. And going off of that, talking about how it reflected a lot of the culture of the time, how much did jazz start to influence the culture that it was in itself? You know, how do we see the broader impact of jazz moving forwards in the 20th century from there? So when I am teaching jazz history in my, in my class, I, I'm, keen to point out that, you know, jazz started in America, but like very, very quickly, it was like almost this global musical, um, genre. So, you know, very shortly after world war one, there are people in Europe and particularly in, in Paris playing jazz that in a lot of ways sounds like the jazz that was being made in the United States. And, um, as jazz takes root in all of these different places, you know, it's, it, it also kind of starts to transform these individual locations. So you have, you know, jazz taking root in, in New York and, um, and you have like the music of Duke Ellington being performed at the Cotton Club and this, this sort of orchestral kind of jazz, this, this big ensemble sort of jazz. And um, that gets people starting to think, oh, well, maybe jazz, you know, can actually be a part of of Western art music. Maybe jazz can be a a serious music in the way that we've often understood music to be serious. Um, And, um, you know, and then at the same time, you have um, people not just in New Orleans, but in other cities continuing to play hot jazz, continuing to play like a jazz that, that would sound to our ears to be very um, early jazz, this polyphonic jazz, this jazz where instruments are all soloing at the same time, all playing together. And, um, and their argument is basically that, well, actually, this is the tradition that matters, you know, that, um, that we should be celebrating, um, you know, this, this kind of, um, this roots-based music, you know, that we don't have to become um, more Western or we don't have to become more European in order to be taken seriously, this is something that should be taken seriously. And we have that divide still, you know, in the way that we listen to African-American um, music, you know, we, we have um, some, some sort of African-American music traditions that um, people are, 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 are keen to point out have a real rooted sound or that connect to the rooted side of the tradition. And we have, um, others which have 
this more, um, you know, European or Westernized sound. And, um, and, you know, people argue for the importance or the, you know, the not so much importance of both of those in different ways. It's, it's still very much the way that people are, are kind of talking about which kind of music is most valuable. Yeah. Uh, so, Chris, what is the contrast you've observed between how jazz musicians uh, historically have conceptualized their practice uh, compared to modern times? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Obviously, there's initially um, sort of an entertainment focus, right? This is, you know, jazz. I, I mean, I don't know if it, if we can ever say that it was popular music. If it was ever popular music, it was popular during the swing era. And that's when it's functioning as an entertainment kind of music. But even in the swing era, you have bands that are trying to be like really experimental, you know, like like the 1930s equivalent of like prog rock kind of bands, you know, weird forms in the music that they're putting together and sort of unusual orchestrations. And so that sort of that that sense of of um, taking oneself seriously as an artist actually goes back like quite a long way. I'd say that in the jazz world that we're looking at right now, you know, that is predominantly the the sort of the thinking that jazz, you know, is highly valuable, really artistic music, not necessarily something that is played for for entertainment. Um, you know, purposes. Uh, and, um, but, you know, that's not a modern idea. Like that idea has actually been around, you know, for quite a long time. It's just something that gained a lot more energy um, with the birth of bebop in the 1940s and then the sort of explosion of jazz genres that we get in the 1950s with, uh, with West Coast jazz and cool jazz. Um, like the music played by the modern jazz quartet, who I write quite a bit about. Um, but yeah, it's an idea that goes back quite a way. Now, as you were talking about with the kind of progressive and very compositionally focused parts of jazz, that kind of feels to me as the uh, murder mystery connoisseur, kind of a similar touch where murder mystery was a lot about the puzzles and the in- intricacies of how you put it together. And jazz is known for complex and intricate uh, progressive performances and compositions. Do you think that that kind of approach to art of complex intricacies in creativity was something that reflected the times from when jazz started to originate? Well, I think it's definitely something that, you know, is is reflected in jazz culture. Man, that is such an excellent question. And um, let me sort of explain why I'm excited by that question. You know, big. I, I don't read that many murder mysteries, but the ones that I do a huge part of the joy of reading those murder mysteries is like trying to figure out what, you know, what happened. And you are kind of operating or you're, you're sort of building your, your logical framework up based on a awareness of what has happened in the past murder mystery novels you've read. That's why the, the genre kind of works. And that's definitely, you know, the culture of jazz as well. So we have a lot of jazz works that we, um, you know, we would see the title of us like a jazz standard, like Autumn Leaves. Um, but we never know, like, what that is going to sound like based on the title of that work. We would know the structure, the general structure. We'd know that, you know, okay, well, there's like a harmonic framework. And we're probably going to hear glimpses of that harmonic framework as we move through the story of the music. Um, and there is a melody, so... We might not hear all of the melody, but we'll probably hear some key parts of the melody as we move through these familiar things. Um, but we don't ever really know, you know, what what is going to, how people are going to realize this sort of general narrative structure. And so I think, yeah, there's, there's some really interesting um, overlaps in terms of how, um, you know, creatively somebody goes about putting together um, a murder mystery story and how somebody goes about um, putting together um, a jazz work that's going to resonate with with lovers of jazz, people who have been listening to jazz for a long time. It's really interesting seeing where the topics of murder mystery and, and, and jazz in particular kind of coincide. You've been listening to Death of the Reader. This was Flex and Herds with Chris Vercurdy from the University of Sydney. Uh, thank you very much for chatting with, with us today, sir. Yeah, thanks very much for having me <laughs> Thank you. 
You're listening to Death of the Reader here on 2SER. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are at the end of the Benson murder case. And it's time to talk about how fair this story was. I think it was pretty fair. I think it was very fair. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not as many twists and turns, except for ones that are kind of played for laughs anyway, because Vance is the worst. Absolutely So, worst. yeah, um, it's a pretty straightforward novel overall. Mm. Um, I'd give it like a six in terms of difficulty. A I'd, six, really? You know, like, I don't even know if it was that hard. That's about like standard detective murder mystery difficulty, I guess. Yeah. I don't know, I'm bad numbers. I mean, this week we are discussing chapters 19 to the end. We're also talking about the fairness of the novel as a whole. And I think one of the interesting things about this novel, as we said earlier on in the show, is that it's very consistent and does what it sets out to do. Yep. You will not be bamboozled in any way by this novel, including really by the puzzle. Yeah. It's not terribly difficult. As as smart as Vance is, I feel like he's almost acting that intelligent because then the reader will feel that intelligent. That is I mean, actually a really like interesting that's... point. Yeah, I hadn't really considered that. I feel like that's the intent that he's going for. Like, hey, now you too can feel smart because this, you know, foppish uh, upperclassman is saying all these smart things and you feel the same way. Isn't that funny? Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier in the show, I got my family to read chapters one to eight of this and every single one of them pinged the major by the time we got there. Yeah. And it's interesting because... On the one hand, does that say that the story is really easy? Or is that mm. perhaps a criticism of the way that we pick to do these stories? <laughs> Where by the fact that you said end at chapter 8, immediately we assume that all the clues are laid out there. If you are doing this story along with us, perhaps the most accurate way to do it would be to go with the extended cut, which comes out at the end of each novel. Yep. You have all three of them together and you can do it in one big long heap. That's how I do it. But, you know, either way, I think that doing these stories segmented provides an interesting challenge because also if you're the kind of reader that got to the end of chapter eight and you think to yourself, I have no idea what's going mm. on. You can stop and go, okay, there is supposed to be enough information yeah. to work with here. Go back and try, you know, figure something extra out. And that I think mm. is a really cool thing. Well, this is the fun part when we get to, to rules and stands and things was Knox, I think in, in one of his blurbs in the floating Admiral, uh, he, he said something about having to present the culprit in the first four or five chapters um, which clearly, if mm. Fife was to be the culprit, Van Damme would not be playing by that particular rule. Absolutely. Because he has, he has his own set of rules. Um, and that that was kind of the fun thing, right? Working through this story with rules that we we know. We know the 20 rules of Van Dyne. We have them online. You can go find them. Um, but trying to figure out exactly how to apply them. And for me, I have my own special little attachment to one of his rules, which says that there must be no love because murder mission is not about love. And yet... When we were debating last week and I was straight up telling you exactly what was going on and you were like, no, there's no way there will be love in this. It'll be that Major Benson has threatened Lecoq into, you know, putting out this confession and saying they've done it. And I was saying, no, it's because he loves Sinclair. He wants to protect her. That's exactly what was going on the whole time. And you know what? That's totally fine. I'm fine yeah. with making a mistake because it makes me <laughs> seem human, unlike Philo Vance. It does. You are not as inhuman as Philo Vance. He could put a little gold medal on you there and your shirt there and we um, know. There aren't a lot of um, active active things being done by the characters. And I've touched on this earlier, how this very much feels like a game board or a chess board where Vance is, is making a move and Major Benson is making his anti-move. You know, whenever we see Vance do some detectiving, or I guess it's more accurate to say that it's Markham versus Major Benson because Vance is actually not on the board at all. He's just floating above it. He sees everything that's going on. Um, but we're watching these two characters going back and forth trying to accuse or deceive the other. But the other pieces don't really do anything. The other characters on the board just kind of sit there and get interrogated and are called in, called out. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like, I guess you could say, checkers versus chess in that sure. chess has a lot more personality in the way the pieces are designed and the way that each can only do certain moves, whereas in checkers, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot more linear narrative going on there. Sure. That's but it's a still way. a very interesting tactical game. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. Um, I, I will say, though, speaking of, you know, rules and playing it down the line, mm. this follows Van Dyne's rules so by the letter that I think yep. it made it easy. Yep, I agree. Um, it also follows Ronald Knox's rules, interestingly enough, which I think was fun and maybe says something about the context of those rules. Mm. If you're unfamiliar with those, we have uh, specials on the podcast running through a lot of them. But I, I do like that for a man that's struck out and said, this is how you write a good story, he's done it. He's yeah. done the story the way he said he was going to. Yeah. 
Um, I would say that you would have a better time with this novel if you didn't know the rules because it would maybe make the puzzle a bit more challenging. But at the same time, if you're into picking apart stories and saying like, oh, well, this is why they did this and this is why they did this, it's mm. fascinating seeing all of the rules be put in place like nearly one after the yeah. other. If you're the kind of person who would sit down and cross-reference every single one of the 20 rules of Van Dyne and possibly listen, also listen. the 20 of, of Knox <laughs> with each chapter of the novel, you will love this book. Uh, so Flex many loved notes. It. Flex so loved this book. many notes. <laughs> I've ha- do I have to take that golden pin off now? No, you can keep it. Oh, you can keep you. it. But thank you. It's offset by your, your showing of love to these characters. Now, the other thing I have to take issue with, and this is maybe a bit separate from mm. the story itself, Herds, is that you keep calling Leacock Lecoq. I can't help myself. It's ingrained in my in my mind. Um, yeah, I mean, Leacock, obviously named after Mr. Lecoq, uh, who was who was one of the, the detectives written by Emile Gabariot. Uh he's a bumbling fool in that, and it's very much reflected. Uh, in the way that Van Dyne portrays Leacock in this novel. Mm. He's very much uh, a rube. He's very much being led around by these romantic notions. And uh, it's funny to see the influence of Gabario, obviously a, a you know a French murder mystery fiction writer, on Van Dyne's work. And I do, I do really enjoy that. It's definitely one of the examples of many in this book where he brings up other detective fiction authors and mm. stories, including when he spoils one, in case you missed that. Yeah. Um, he, <laughs> I mean, yeah, he's very clearly influenced by a lot of works, yeah. which I can appreciate. Absolutely. Um, a writer who writes in a vacuum is going to create nothing but soulless trash. And so that's the harshest thing I'll ever say on this show. Wow, it's a is, nebulous accusation. And I know exactly who I'm thinking when I say this, but I, w- I dare not say their name unless they come to the studio and <laughs> throw androids at me or something. Yeah, and I do think that as we've said many times when discussing this book, it's either so self-aware it's brilliant or so blind that it's double-blinded itself into self-awareness. Yes. But either one of those results is self-aware. Yep. And regardless of how you perceive how Van Dyne wrote it, mm. it still means that if you are reading this, you are getting a picture of early you know, 1930s yeah. detective fiction, 1920s detective fiction as a whole. Yep. And I love that. Even if that picture hasn't aged very well. Well, I mean, who would age very well after that many years? I mean, you're right. Uh, I certainly wouldn't. I I probably wouldn't even be here. I'd be like, I'd be like an old man sitting in some cabin out in the woods yelling at young people. I'm really looking forward to <laughs> SS Van Dyne himself just walking into this studio, looking 20 years uh, of age, having what? become the character that he set out to be, uh, a fit, a healthy aristocrat. With Lots of a art. collection of art yeah. and a bunch of friends who hate him but don't really hate him. It's a bit like us, really. I mean, basically. Ex- excluding the aristocracy and wealth. <laughs> uh, just our relationship across this table here and our relationship with you is a bit like Markham. I was going to say, we, are t- we, we, we tell, are you saying that we tell everyone that we're best friends but we actually hate each other? Is that what we're saying here? Maybe it is. Or maybe it's the opposite. I forget. One of those. So, uh... Do we close this? Do we close this episode as Vance and Markham instead Vance of Markham. <laughs> instead of Flex and Herds? I I feel like that's only appropriate. But before we uh, before we disappear, yes, uh, I know that you have to tell me what what novel we're doing for well, next week. Herds, for I've, next three I've, weeks, I've, I hear I've come to bamboozle you. What? I I know you're shocked. I know that I didn't warn you at all. I am shocked. Uh, we are doing another. S.S. Van Dyne story. Is that allowed by the rules that we've set down? That is allowed by the rules we've never set down. <laughs> you know what isn't allowed by the rules we never tell set me, down? Tell me. We're not allowed to do anything other than books, which okay. is why next week we're doing The Kennel Murder Case uh-huh. by S.S. Van Dyne, mm-hmm. the movie. Oh my goodness. I'm looking forward to that. Yes. Said by some critics to be the best murder mystery adaptation for film <gasps> ever. Ever? Ever. Including the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies? Including. Wow. I can't imagine a higher bar. Yeah. I. <laughs> and the fun thing is, normally when we get to this point in the show and we say this is what we're doing next week, one of us has read it, so we know what's happening. I haven't watched the movie. I don't know what we're in for. I'm terrified. We know what that means. We're doing it as a one-week special. Yeah. The we... Kennel Murder Case on Death of the Reader. This is going to be great. It is going to be a fun time. I'll bring the popcorn. We are Vance and Markham. This is Death of the Reader on 2SER. See you next week. Next week, Vance.